right, good. Okay, so uh, the, what was I going to say? Yes, about WordPress that, and uh, templates. Okay, this has nothing to do with WordPress, thing, but can you see the, the birds on my screen now? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so let's go. So there are two sites for WordPress. One is WordPress.org and one is WordPress.com. Uh, the other one has mostly free stuff and the other one has things that cost. Anyway, WordPress.org has a lot of themes which are basically templates for how to create a website. There are these 20, 19, 20, 20 things that are already there for, uh, that are WordPress own uh, templates. Then there are uh, quite a lot of other ones. I take a feature filter, filter to see which ones have a grid layout. Because that's something I want to talk to you about today. Grid layouts. So here. Overlay grid. <coughs> Sorry. So things on most websites are put in grids. Also, if you look at any uh, magazine, printed magazine or printed newspaper, they are also laid out in grids. And uh, in the old days, you had to have a designer who would make make you that grid to get a clean layout but uh, these days there are templates everywhere so you don't need to know that much about uh, layouts and grids in order to use them and in order to make uh, nice looking stuff so uh, in one way, there's less horrible looking uh, websites and uh, printed stuff around than there were uh, than there was before because of these uh, layers. Uh, but the side effect, of course, is that there might be not as many jobs for people who work for, for layout, layout designers. So visual designers, graphic designers have to uh, do also a lot of other stuff these days in order to uh, to be, uh, well, in order to earn money. Uh, there's something called theme forest, maybe you know it, which has a lot of uh, WordPress templates. Most of these are, well, commercial, so, so that you have to pay for them. But, well, theme forest has also to lots of template kits for uh, other stuff, as you can see. So this is only one of the many places where you can uh, get templates for no, not much, uh, and you don't have to pay that much. At least you don't pay here as much as you would uh, to a designer that would do a website for you. or a design uh, studio. 
Okay, so that is one of the big changes that has been happening in the uh, in the past few years. Another thing is that uh, there have there are there's also apps that help you make uh, layouts in an easier way than uh, InDesign. But uh, many of them are not actually very helpful if you're trying to do something like professional uh, typography. Uh, well, I've been using or trying out the Affinity Publisher for a while, while now. No, I don't know everything about it. I'm still learning it also, uh, but I'm slowly migrating towards Affinity Publisher from uh, Adobe InDesign. So I'm still doing a lot of stuff with InDesign, but also I'm noticing that uh, sometimes I'm I just go into Affinity Publisher and do something there. And the, the difference between those two is there, but it's not that much. And you can do quite um, professional stuff also on uh, Affinity, I've noticed. Okay. So, if we before we go to uh, the uh, software, so let's. Uh, I'll ask you now. What what kinds of where do you have you seen uh, layout design used these days? So, if you can name a couple of examples. Posters. Posters, good. Uh huh. So printed posters. Social media. Social media. Uh, which one do you have in mind, for instance? Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yes. Other places where you have use uh, layout design. Or where you create it yourself. Or where there is a need. Magazines. Of course. Newspapers. Mm -hmm. And also those online versions of the magazines and newspapers. So, web. On all kinds of reports. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Company reports. Yes. Even C personal CVs. What about that website like Canva that does, has a lot of like layout designs like for different things like Facebook um, um, covers and all kinds of like covers and yes, is that also Yes, kind of like Yeah, of course. Then there's, uh, of course, mobile apps where you need user interface design, but it's uh, basically also layout design, but uh, for an interactive purpose. Uh, also, there are all kinds of uh, well, screens, for instance, for cars these days. Uh, so I guess all of you have at some point seen these car uh, screens. I, will, I was making this kind of interactive screen for a forest uh, 
machine, uh, you know, these uh, big machines that are, go around forests and uh, fell trees. So they have uh, we did uh, with an other designer, we did some uh, some of these UI screens back in the early 2000s for for these kinds of uh, machines. Okay, of course, uh, computer programs like, I don't know, these days everything seems to be an app. Like, instead of saying program, you say app. But uh, I like to think that there is a difference. But even my Mac, after I, I have uh, put a new. <laughs> Updated it instead of programs folder. It says that that it, there's an app folder. So for a while I was worried that all my programs had gone, but they were in the apps folder. Anyway, language changes, uh, and so do the layout programs. So there is a, still a lot of need for layout design. Although not, maybe not in the places that you, that have been uh, traditional. So now I'm in Affinity Publisher and the starting screen is quite similar to the other Affinity programs, just like they are in the Adobe programs. So there are a lot of uh, web uh, screens available. Oh, this is, notice these social media story posts, social media portrait, portrait posts, and square posts. And there's also a CD cover digital re release. So this also gives some uh, hints to what people, what kind of uh, layout design people are doing these days. And I think these we have uh, looked at earlier already. That said, uh, I, I will open up a, a print document. By the way, are there how many? Oh yes, I've noticed that Adobe InDesign has a lot of ready-made templates. These, uh, at least in the, the newest Creative Cloud version, this doesn't seem to have many uh, templates. But I guess you can download them for for a fee in Affinity if you want to. Anyway, to create a new template, I'm now, I did uh, think about a day task for you and that you can find some of the day task uh, elements already in the affinity, uh, in the Moodle, course Moodle. And the idea was here that I wanted to go through or show you some of the methods that I use for making a layout. This would be for a fictional magazine that, that would also be your uh, day task to have four pages for a fictional magazine and to have an article. Uh, I took an article from the New Scientist magazine. And, okay, let's see. Yes. There it is. 
There we go. So the files for the day task, the, the two articles are there. Another one is about gray hair, and the other one is about the colors of these birds called blue jays. And I've taken a couple of uh, photos from the internet. But what I thought I'd now demonstrate to you would be the article about the gray hair. You can choose either one, but... Uh, oh yes, and I put some uh, resources here. There's some principles and elements of layout design. Or oh, about the Fibonacci golden ratio. And a couple of common design mistakes. By the way, maybe before we go to Affinity, uh, I should talk a little bit about the principles of layout design. Here we go. This is the, the first article and there are lots of articles on this, but uh, I found this somewhere during last year, this article, and I uh, I think it has every important element very, and it, it tells them really clearly. Uh, so I was mentioning the grids for for professional designs so or for layout designs earlier, or the types of grid. So let's see what it all about. So the parts of a grid. So basically, you have to start with uh, something, usually, sometimes it's a page, usually, sometimes it's a browser window, sometimes it's the screen of, of your, of a mobile phone. What's in most uh, layout designs you is a margin and I think every everyone of you knows about margins so here you go and there's this tip that if you have a book design or a magazine design it's good to have uh, enough margin both on the inside and the outside to uh, because if it's a thick book then the everything that is in the like uh, close to the inside will uh, will get bent a little bit so you can't see it quite clearly And uh, usually in very classic old style um, layouts, the margin that is in the bottom, bottom is uh, larger than the margin of, in the top. It makes it visually more pleasing to the human eye to have that kind of you know, relationship. So, so there's more space at the bottom than more space the in the bottom than in the top. So, oh. but that goes for the mostly for printed uh, pages and also for uh, well uh, for mobile uh, designs. Not that much in web design because in web design, well, it's like this: you <laughs> everything is on in the move. Okay, then there are these flow lines or 
which are usually called bass lines. So it's also in, in design and affinity, you can find something called the baseline grid, which helps you keep your, basically your lines of text uh, aligned. Aligning is, by the way, a really important element. Then there's modules, either columns or rows. So if you have uh, vertical groups, then we call them columns and horizontal ones, they are rows. And uh, together they make modules and you can have uh, this area between them and then or not have an area there and that changes. In classical layouts uh, there were not many rows so usually there were only columns but uh, this modular grid layout has been around for how long? Maybe 90 years or 80 years? Anyway, since the 1930s and 1940s, the modular grids were actually created in Switzerland. Uh, and there was a guy whose name is hard to pronounce if you don't no German, he's called, he was called Jan Tschichold. If you look him, if I look him up in the Wikipedia, you can see how it's written. There we go. Jan Tschichold, graphic designer. It's an interesting way that, like, how it's... Uh, <laughs> oh, he was... Uh, uh, born even with a more difficult name. <laughs> anyway, this guy was one of those who invented the modular grids in typography, like a really important person in uh, typography, like a big star. Anyway. Let's go back to the article. There we go. Then, so there are also regions and in, uh, in the better uh, layout programs, you can actually see these uh, regions or you can create them yourself. So this is all about how to put information on whichever uh, medium you are using, how to organize that information in a uh, clear as possible way. So all of these things are supposed to help you with organizing that information for your uh, user or reader. So there's uh, a clearer look what columns are and columns don't have to be uh, the same width on a, on a page. And then there are rows and gutters in between. Yes, we talked about this. And And okay, markers. Uh, anyway, in, in most layouts where you have several pages, you have these elements that are repeated. And that's why good layout programs have something called master pages. And these elements are put into the master page so that um, they will then be automatically repeated everywhere. We'll look at that in Affinity quite soon. So, okay, types of grids. 
So basically, we already covered many of these. Column grids, baseline grids, modular grids, hierarchical. So there's the like basic manuscript grid, which is older than the Middle Ages. This was used already in, uh, well, papyri in ancient Egypt, like when they had these scrolls. Uh, so they put the uh, text into this kind of grid. So this kind of layout design is at least 4,000 years old. So remember what I said earlier about the uh, things not changing very quickly in layout design. Okay, then there's a symmetrical manuscript grid. And now here you can see that the space uh, on the top is bigger than in the bottom. That's not very uh, well. Oh. Then there's the column grid, which is uh, well very much used in newspapers and I guess in American and especially in German newspapers. They still use a lot of this kind of uh, grid where all the columns are the same. Like it's very symmetrical. But uh, mostly people use asymmetric column grids, like here, for instance. This web page, you see that this column is wider than this other one. And note also the use of. Uh, empty space. So I said last week, empty space should be your friend as a designer. Okay, again, there's three columns. And then the question is always how to combine text together with images, together with uh, empty space, and also these, abs what I call abstract elements, like, which give rhythm to the whole thing. Okay, so there is one general tip that I learned while uh, studying about, because I had this uh, problem, I used to have this problem with the yields that I put the same amount of images and the same amount of text on a page. Or I put, uh, if there was a spread, like here, a spread is when you have two pages like this. That's a spread. In Finnish it's augerma. Anyway, the other mistake that I did that I put this uh, on the other page of the spread, there was a big image and on the other uh, side, there was the same amount of text that there was uh, image like visually and it looked boring and I didn't know why it looked boring until somebody said that in layout there should be either the images should be uh, the leaders or the dominating elements or the text should be the dominating element and there should be enough empty space to give like breathing space for for the reader and after that uh, i had this like uh, revelation like whoa <laughs> Layouts, they work. Yeah, but because before that, I really couldn't get them to work. Okay, here, by the way, you can see these, uh, what are called abstract elements. 
that give rhythm to to the page. Okay, there's the modular grid, where of course you don't uh, use these tiny modules, but you use them as your help to put things on the page. In, uh, by the way, in modern uh, layouts, it's quite common to have uh, images go throughout a spread or have uh, images and texts uh, go on top of each other. Yeah, you just have to see that the that the text can still be read. That if there is an image or texture behind it, that it's a, that the place is for it is peaceful. Because if there's a lot of things happening on the background of the text, then you can't really read it at all. Okay, here's one example of a modular uh, layout grid. They are really everywhere these days. So you just have to know where to look. And let's say once you really learn how to use a mo like modular uh, grid layout, then then you, your worries with layouts are over. <laughs> then it's like um, riding the bicycle. That once you know, once you get the balance on the bicycle, then you're okay with it for the rest of your life. And with layouts, once you know how to use the modular grid, then uh, then you can say that you can you can do layouts. Okay, then there are some terms here, like the main headline, subhead, there's the caption, primary text, or also body text. Another thing, it's not a good idea to use a lot of different kinds of fonts, but there is, a, but usually you use a different font for the uh, headline than the uh, body text. Okay. Hierarchical grids. So basically, well, I already mentioned the hierarchies that you have to divide information somehow, and usually these the grids help, should help you with that. Okay. So you can find books on this subject also in the Dunk library if you want. Uh, on grid layouts, I mean. So here we're also a couple of, couple of things that I found really useful or where all the basic stuff has been uh, expressed in a short and clear way, like what things you need to play with when you play with, uh, when you do layouts or when you do visual design in general. There's the space, uh, the shape, line, texture, typography, and color. Then the principles of a design, balance, scale, contrast, emphasis, and harmony. So once you know how to play with these elements, then you're good to go as a designer. Anyway, maybe we should go now into the 
Affinity Publisher and start doing things. So, like I said, I wanted to have this like imaginary magazine, which would be where the page would be an A5 size, and that the article would take four pages. And I wanted to have also a master page there. And yes, I do want to have facing pages. That's not always the case. For instance, if you're doing like a PDF presentation for something, then, then you would probably use a landscape oriented uh, page and not do facing pages at all. By the way, when you are doing your the portfolio of the of the day tasks that you have done, uh, see to it that it's in horizontal format because uh, I'm going to look at the portfolios on my screen, so it doesn't make much sense if if everything is in in a vertical format. Okay, and then the question is, should the uh, pages start from the right or from the left? I'm, and I'm saying that, okay, let's start them from the right. I want to have like this cover page. This time. Then there's the margin thing. I do want to have margins, but I will probably change them at some point. But let, let's make them, oh, by the way, here's the like little uh, lock, locking button. If, if you don't want everything to be symmetrical, and so then just click away the lock. I think I'll start with, 15 millimeter inner and outer margins. The top might also be 15, but I'll keep the bottom at 30. Then there's bleed. Okay, does uh, anyone, could in, anyone tell me what bleed is? Have you heard of it? Are they the margins outside of the design that are necessary when you want to print? Mm. Yes. So if you're doing something for like online or uh, apps or such, you, then, then the bleed is unnecessary. But when, when you have something that is going to be printed, um, well, Printing machines are not always totally accurate. So, and in uh, well, modern layouts, you often have uh, images that go right uh, to the uh, uh, over the margins and over the page uh, to the edge of the page. So then uh, if there is like this uh, small inconsistency and then your image doesn't have any, or your layout doesn't have any bleed, then the image that goes to the uh, uh, to the edge would look silly a little bit. So I will, Put, put here some three millimeters of bleed everywhere and I think that's enough. And now I can create the page. So 
the things we can see here are very similar to what you can see in InDesign. So there's the master page that I uh, talked about. And I can go to the master page which by double clicking on it, on it. So everything that I do now here will be seen here on the, these other pages as well. And in the uh, pages panel, you can quickly add pages or also move them around. That's uh, been made uh, easy. Also there's the uh, easy delete uh, button. You can also have more than one master. You can create uh, several masters if you have like uh, maybe a book design that, or a magazine design where you have uh, dozens or maybe hundreds of pages and some of them need slightly other kinds of uh, layouts. Then you can uh, create more than one master. Okay, but I'll show you what it means that uh, things on the master page are shown everywhere. So let's create an ellipse. Like here is the rectangle tool and uh, there are lots and lots of other kinds of areas here. That's where affinity is different from. Uh, in design. So if I now create this ellipse, let's give it some fill. And so now you can see quite clearly that it's here on each of the page. So yes. And uh, by the way, then we have two selection tools, just like we had in other affinity programs, and just like we have, for instance, in Adobe Illustrator, InDesign, and we have the uh, node tool where we can get to uh, details. And then there's the move to, so V, the other one, you click V on the keyboard and for the note tool you click A, just like elsewhere. It's very handy to have those around. Okay, but now I clicked uh, backspace and deleted that one. Okay, so before I get, go away from the master page, I want to create a grid here that uh, where I can put stuff. So right now it's not showing much, so I can go here to uh, view and start by letting it show the margins. Okay, there they are. And I also want to show the rulers. They are already there, but uh, they are not there by default. So you might have to click here and click show rulers. Also show the uh, baseline grid. I noticed, uh, I've noticed that it doesn't actually show the baseline grid always. Okay, by the way, you can also lock the guides if you want to. But, um, okay, what you also find here is the guides manager and the grid and access manager. Uh, you can, of course, pull out uh, guides from this uh, area like this. 
if you want to and you can also manipulate these guides unless you have explicitly locked them but what I want to do is to go to the uh, guides manager and see what it's giving me here we go I think in InDesign the guides manager is a little bit more handy than here but I've learned to uh, go around the, the some of the problems that I've had uh, with this one I'll show, I'll show you what the what my problem has been okay so uh, you can create uh, columns and rows from here column guides and it's also showing the gutter Uh, like here now we have four columns and I think I'll make the gutter smaller let's make it four millimeters yes and as also I can make more rows now this is quite symmetrical here and I can also choose if these are filled or if they are just outlines the problem here is that it's making these guides go together with the margins and in InDesign you can just there's just a button that you can click if the guides follow the margins or not here you can't do that and that's a bit of a uh, annoyance for me but uh, yeah I can show you how I've managed to bypass that so around here I can pull my this guide to the center the software is helping me do this thing to find the centers there you go so also i want to have this one here there you go so these ones i'm definitely going to use that's why I'm creating these guides for it and these also automatically snap together with guides yeah. and you can see that as I'm creating these guides over here they are also created over here and I can see exactly where they go so now I wanted to have uh, some guides here in the in the center but the margins are uh, well preventing me from that uh, what I could do would be I could of course create another guide over here and now that I know now that I know this guide where where it is I could just put the uh, by the way it's this one I think yes oh no it's the middle one 74 millimeters I could just uh, say that okay this one here 
is half of that 74. So 74 divided by two, and then I press enter, and now I get 37, and now it's in, in the middle. I could have ju also just uh, put the uh, inner and outer margins away, so I would see exactly where to put these. I could do that. So that's another way of doing it. Zero and zero. Okay, and now, can, now I can see that uh, this is not quite where I want it to be. There we go. There. And I'll add guides for these as well. Okay, and now I can put my margins back. And close this. And I can click here that I don't want to see, actually see the column guides. Okay, and I see that I forgot to create these two guides over there. Anyway, let's go with this one. Now, if I go here, if I don't want to see these guides, uh, there's this quick button, toggle preview mode, so which is really helpful and useful. Okay, there's a text I want to import here, and also there's images. So this is the text. Gray hairs sometimes regain the, their color when we feel less stressed. So for me, it, uh, as a layout designer, it's important to know what the content of the text is. Like uh, I know some people who do their layouts uh, like blindly, they just uh, don't read the content, but uh, actually content and design and the way it looks like they should go together. So what is this about? It's about a study where they have noticed that some, some people's gray hair goes away when they are less stressed. So they start growing hair that has the, their original hair color instead of gray. And as for me, um, who am, and I'm over 50, so for me that this is uh, very nice news. Anyway. So there's the uh, title of the text. So it should probably be 
in the on the first uh, page in some form and I also want it to be big I also want to have a big splash image there so I I need to look for pictures on grey hair or ideally I could take photos myself of uh, some grey haired, haired people or go if I now had the resources I could go to one of the many places where you can buy pictures. Uh, that's undoubtedly also the good thing about um, having the Adobe Creative Cloud license is that they have this very big library of photos that you can then use. But I tried uh, looking for just some very simple thing the other day in the Creative Cloud library and I just couldn't find it. Uh, I was trying to find for well, close-ups of eyes and that was proved to be very difficult so I had to take my own photos. Uh, anyway, so let's go look for grey hair and how to look it. So, uh, so you can see that there are, it's giving us already lots of images but now as my budget is zero but then I will first go to tools and then take the uh, image search and again tools and now I need to have the size first big large pictures and then I need to look at for look to the uh, copyrights so I want to have images that can be used non-commercially and maybe also uh, manipulated somehow There we go. So now I need to uh, check what what the size is. Let's see this one. This is three thousand pixels by two thousand. Uh, that's actually not very not bad. Uh, but I'm not sure if the image is of good quality or not. I could take copy it. Right here, number one. I always rename my the images that I uh, download, but also I try to have uh, name them in a clear way that I I can find them. Okay, this is nice, but quite small, a thousand pixels, and I don't need these images of young women who have uh, clearly uh, dyed their hair. It needs to be something that looks real. So this is real. And also it doesn't have anybody's face in it, which is also good because the uh, emphasis to me should be in the hair. So this I might want to use as Splash image. Three hairs. And it's a JPEG. So good. Gray hair. Yikes. Okay, this is not very big. This 
It was also quite nice. So let's see. I'll open it first and look. Okay. Okay, here's a better picture. You always have to check. Okay, and we are here in uh, this website, Pixir, which is a public domain for images, which is good. And now you can see that there are many images available. Yes, this is a good one. You can see that you can uh, zoom in it quite far before you can see the pixels. Okay, this is the plate. Oh, let the in finish. go and before I take any of the images into uh, publisher I need to take them to affinity photo and check the the DPIs okay the gray hair plate came as a weird format and have to check that it's the first one so document resize document okay this is already 300 dpi good i don't need to change anything there also uh, it looks like a quality photo, like it, it has very nice uh, colors and such. Okay, this is not good. I can't use the, this one. I probably downloaded the wrong image here. So I need to go back and see. Okay, it wants me to log in. Okay. Uh, sometimes what I do when I want to have a photo and I don't want to bother with the these file formats. I just take a screenshot, but it's not as good then, of course, because the, uh, yeah, it will only let me download this if I, uh, If I log in here, okay, but at least I have already one very good gray hair Im image which I can use in the. Uh, Uh, on the first page. So let's start with that. So there are a couple of ways of uh, putting uh, 
images here. Uh, the well, easiest one, I guess, is just to place uh, the image by file and place, just like you would do in Affinity Designer or maybe uh, Adobe Illustrator. There we go. And then you just place it somewhere. There we have it. And it's certainly big enough. Then another way of doing this is to place it inside a frame. And this way you can do your layout design before you can, before you don't uh, uh, place any images there. Okay, so I'll just use, a, I'll cut it away like command and X, so that it's still in the memory of the program. And then I will create this frame. There are ellipse, uh, picture frames and rectangle picture fr frames. So I will put the frame all over the page this time. There it is. And then right click and paste the image as content. There we go. And now it has pasted it in the, uh, well, wrong sides. Like I can check here which size it took. Sometimes this is what I find strange in uh, this uh, software, Infinity Publisher, that when you paste images in in these frames, the the program tries to paste them somehow uh, in connection to the to the frame. So sometimes it may make the image bigger even, which is always not recommendable. Because that will uh, create havoc to your uh, image resolution. So you can always make the image smaller, but never resize it into the into bigger. Okay, but now it's uh, 100 and this is quite intuitive how you move the image inside the frame. So I want to make, put some space for the, the title. Yeah, this might work. And I'm looking for basic uh, compositional things here as well. Like uh, putting things that go through the image like this. Okay, I'll place a title there and after that I think it's time for a small break. So okay, there are two text tools, there's the artistic text tool and the frame text tool and just like in Affinity Designer you can, with the artistic text tool you can put the text on uh, uh, well, on, a, on some vector line or inside somewhere, but uh, let's just make a basic text. 
Oh, and I forgot to copy the, the title. So I'll do that now. Okay. Back to the artistic text and Oh, okay. It sometimes does this. I think there is a small, I need to do this thing. Usually this happens around 11 uh, in the evening. I don't have any Microsoft programs on this computer, so don't know where, where that comes from. Anyway, the artistic text. Again, I'll try to create it. I'm not even sure if the artistic text is the right option here or, should, or if it should have been a text block. Uh, I think this time I'll create directly this uh, frame text which makes a block out of it. So it's easier to handle in many ways. Here we go. And it's obviously in the, not the way I want it to be. So I will, what I did was I took the move tool and then clicked on the uh, frame again. This way I can change the whole text without uh, selecting it. The same goes for uh, InDesign by the way. So now, when I'm going through these, you can see the uh, changes. So I think I'll try out with the Helvetica condensed bold, or maybe black. Uh, let's, yeah, let's try the black one first. And of course, bigger. A lot bigger because with titles you can uh, play with the size and try out different thing, things. And now you can see that not everything is shown and uh, if I go here I could click on this chain and uh, link this text box with, with another. It's quite intuitively made in this program. Okay, so if I want to keep my text on this side, maybe I, I'd, it would be, make sense to align it from the right and have a ragged left edge. No. Or I could have put this as a mirror image. Okay, this is not bad, but could, you, could it be even bigger? Maybe 53 points? Yeah, why not? Then I could the next thing I could try out would be uh, testing different uh, colors here for the text itself. Or having some sort of uh, effect there. Maybe a sort of uh, outer glow or something, but I, I don't think I'll do that. 
Okay, what, well, this is certainly not the right color, but what I'm trying to find is a good sort of uh, contrast between the image and the text so that you can read the, the text easily enough. What I could try out would be to take the color picker and find some color from the image itself and see if that works. That's this color, for instance. Now I have to click once more in the color picker. It's uh, obviously too. Another way would be to go to the swatches and create a couple of uh, new colors there from this one. So I'll first make this into a swatch color, then I'll click on that and then create a color code. The same things can be found also in uh, Affinity Designer. So I could have these uh, tints and shades or tones, but for instance, from this color. There we go. Now, now I have a row of uh, tints made from this this color. So what I did was I first created this color into a swatch by clicking here. Then I right clicked on that color and then went to create color code. I could also try out the uh, tetradic which will give me uh, other colors that are slightly complementary in, in the color wheel. Uh, I put this video about uh, color uh, schemes uh, into, the, no, into the Moodle, so you can watch that too. So sometimes these work, sometimes they don't. But the idea is that you use similar colors within an image. Or sometimes the classic way is the best. Also content-wise, the well, gray hair is actually white, so maybe white is best here. Could be also, well, why, why don't I try the gradient for the, this? That would also go together with a the theme. And as you know, the uh, the gradients can be changed. Now it's a linear gradient, and I can totally change the colors here.
just like in the article, the color is uh, changed. Okay, where is my article? So having the word stressed in red letters might work. It's by the way, quite weird to do this and then talk about my thoughts at the same time. Okay, uh, so Let's have a short uh, pause of five minutes at this point. Do you have any questions before the, we go on a pause? Okay, then I'll be back in five minutes. Okay, here we go again. So now I'll uh, put screen sharing uh, on again. And we can continue. Okay, and I guess you are seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So, okay. So I would uh, have to include the author's name here, of course, of the article. And if this was a real magazine, it would have its own uh, design rules. It would have its own modular grid already. And typically the, uh, well, uh, the area of the title and the, the uh, first image would be where the uh, layout designer could play the most, but also in the way the uh, images would be uh, put there. But now this is uh, like a, an imaginary magazine and this is the grid that I have imagined it will be using. Okay, so I'll copy the text now and see how it could be put into these three pages. And then uh, what I want to do also would be make these uh, picture frame rectangles ready for the, for the images. And I think these would be separately. And I also want to take some uh, sentence from somewhere in the middle as a, as a separate one to, to catch the interest of, of a casual reader right away. Okay, copy this. Go back here 
And now I will create the first frame text. So there are some rules in how wide uh, well, columns are supposed to be so that they are still uh, nice to read and we can look at some options here, like why, why these rules are there. Okay, um, put the text there. And now it's in the same font that was uh, uh, in the in the original text, Georgia, which is not a bad one in as such, but I could change that to something else. There are fonts, font families. that are better to read and less uh, easy to read, like impact, for instance, you can see that, I think you can see with impact that it's not that easy to read in, when there's a lot of it, but impact works uh, quite well with titles again. Uh, then there's Gil Sans, which is, uh, and Futura, which are these quite modern fonts. And by modern, in this case, I mean that they are uh, less than 100 years old. And these uh, like Caslon and Bodoni, which you can find on on a Mac or Baskerville. Well, Caslon and Bodoni are also thought of as modern fonts, but they are actually from the Renaissance and Baroque era. But they are still used in magazines. You can see see them. Uh, in many places, also in uh, web design. Of course, when you go to Google Fonts, you will find a lot of uh, fonts there that are um, made so that they are optimized for both screen use and print use. There are some of them, some of those fonts. And of course, there are lots of fonts that are just silly. And that's okay too, because we, there has to be also some silliness and fun in layouts and typography. So, So I think this time I'm more in a sans serif mood in a way. So serifs are these uh, small, uh, well, additions or so, well, not additions, but small uh, parts in fonts, for instance, here, Georgia is a serif font. And then Gil Sans is a sans serif font. You can see the difference here. Also Helvetica is a typical sans serif font. I don't know why this nottle has so much stuff here. Uh, well, Palatina is quite classical. It has been made in the Renaissance 
time from uh, Roman st style fonts from like 2000 years old. So uh, let's take the Palatino now. And I think it could be 10 points. You always have to be careful that your font size won't be too small. Um, because if your readers will be, if there will be more, a lot of readers that are more than, let's say 40 years old, then they might have problems with reading very small text. You can, uh, Change the readability also by changing the uh, so called leading or the how basically it's the spacing of the lines. And usually, uh, here you can see how much leading will <laughs> influence it. There's something called the default. Each uh, font has a default optimal uh, leading. Yeah, and I know it's weird that the, that it's not pronounced leading, but uh, it comes from uh, the old print world where there were lead, lead letters made of actual lead. So it's leading. Anyway, let's see. So if I uh, increase the, the line, uh, this is one of the like basic errors. I don't know why it's now trying to uh, correct my the spelling. It's somehow thinking that the text is in Finnish, I guess. So here I can also I can put hyphenation so that it will break the words if necessary. I'm trying to find the language settings. Anyway, if I go to the preview, you won't see that problem. So uh, this is like a typical layout that you, you would have in something like Word, uh, where the, the whole uh, page is covered with text. And it's not, uh, the, the lines are quite uh, long and it's not quite very nice to read such uh, long lines. Also, there is like no regard to the uh, empty page or empty space, I mean. So the empty space is just uh, what's left. <laughs> it's not an active thing in the page layout at all. So uh, usually in magazine layout, you use not quite as wide columns and you leave space, empty space there. And create another column by the way, for the text. And now I want to continue this text in this column. So I will click here on the uh, little chain button and then I click here into the column that I made. And now you can clearly see that this column goes on over here. And now I can also 
play with putting the column elsewhere, maybe over here. How that would look like. So it's uh, still not ideal, but at least there's more breathing space here right now. I could also put some following the grid, uh, put some uh, places for images here. There's something weird going on with my... Okay. Some reason my Okay, this could be one uh, way to place an uh, image or here, maybe. I'm trying to think about ways of uh, not making this too symmetrical, because uh, if it's too symmetrical, then it looks boring. Another way would be to put the end of the article here to the fourth page. So not have that much uh, takes someone one page. That could work. And I could import an image there. Yes, there was the first bad gray hair image. So let's put that as a placeholder. It could work or maybe not. So there are many ways of uh, how to solve this. It could, there, there could be also a logic to, because the first page had this splash image, which went all to the uh, edges, that uh, this image would also be better placed on the, uh, here on the edge. And it doesn't have to be this image, it's just a placeholder. Or I could try out putting it to this edge. And then also see to it that it goes together with the uh, You know, with the grid that I made to give give it more uh, rhythm. Okay, then uh, there are other things such as if this should be, uh, well, where it should be aligned or should it be justified. Uh, usually, if there's not too much text, if then uh, for readability, it's better to have an, a text that is aligned left with a ragged edge, but uh, it shouldn't also shouldn't be too ragged. And there are uh, ways to control that uh, here with the flow options and the justifications. 
also there are things like orphans and widows uh, which are basically lines or words that are left alone at the end of the page or in the uh, uh, beginning of a uh, page or text that look weird there like uh, so so I would recommend that if the there is not too much uh, of text or is it, if it's a magazine then the rugged edge right edge uh, works on the other hand uh, there's a rookie error to have lots of text aligned centrally you can see what that make does if we align the text in a central way and also make it maybe wider how much more difficult it is to read now because there are no uh, fixed points where where you could go back to when when you're reading so it makes reading very slow also of course if we put text over an image that has a lot of things going on then that doesn't work either As you can see, not very good to read now, this text. So there are many errors that you can do in uh, uh, typography. Also, you can make the lines so thin that they are hard to read. Like I'm not trying to make a bad design. Also, if nothing is synced at all, like if this text was a little bit uh, smaller, by the way, it would actually work if the line wasn't that hard to read. Change this to twelve to have a little bit of contrast. And I'll make these smaller. So this makes now no sense in a uh, in a content uh, way just trying out different ways of showing this uh, what I could also try out here again would be different uh, colors for the text but not too many it's quite important not to make things more hard to follow by using a lot of different colors Also, I mentioned the abstract elements that you could have uh, as recurring uh, things, or you could have them going through throughout everywhere, like this. So 
arrange it. There are, of course, layers that you can use to put elements in place. I'm just doing some experiments. Like here, these two are now aligned. And they, or here they could be aligned. Yeah, it could also work. And align these ones. Now I'm not uh, thinking about my original uh, grid. I'm just doing experiments. This is also one way of how you could make a grid that you first experiment with a page and then you make the grid from that experiment and then you use it in uh, subsequent uh, pages or spreads. Of course this space here could be used for other things, for uh, putting other information there. But what I'm also keeping in mind is how to play with the uh, with the empty space that it's helping me. Then before I go to the the Moodle and write the data there, uh, what I wanted to <coughs> you to notice was the just justified uh, text. Uh, I've had some very um, big arguments uh, a couple of times about justified texts. Uh, there are some people who have, who are living in the, um, well, conception that text should be always justified, um, but that's actually not so. And actually, when you have justification, you get a lot of other problems that you, where you need to really know about typography. Oh, that was it. Um, and how to uh, fix these prog problems. So I'm show, I'll show you a couple of these problems. Like here you see that uh, because the program is trying to justify all the lines to uh, to the same width it will it's making very big uh, word uh, distances so the and it makes the text look not very good there are even more uh, Horrible uh, examples, for instance, if you click on justified all, then this will happen and nobody wants to read stuff like this. So this is a classic error. So usually if you justify, it's justified left, and then you'll have to go to the, all those uh, settings that you find under paragraph for the hyphenation and for the justification. Here they are. Like you have to set an optimal, in an optimal way, how far the uh, letters are from each other and how far the words are from each other in percentages. And sometimes you also have to 
justify some of the stuff by hand or kern the letters. Uh, so we don't have time to go into typographical details on this course, but I'm just like showing you the direction where you can go. If you want to, you can deepen your knowledge quite a lot on these things. Okay, uh, but first of all, it's good to know the like basic design principles, the basic principles of visual uh, uh, design of how to do composition, compositions, uh, visual compositions, I mean. And those will help you quite far and also your, like, use your visual eyes, like something called the optical control, that you look at it and see if it's working. Okay, and uh, by the way, when you export, exporting from publisher is quite uh, easy. Uh, you go to export. Okay, it has some errors, so I should, I guess, I, uh, yeah, the errors are probably that mm, not all the text that is there uh, has been opened up, so, but I'm just ignoring it right now. And yes, you can uh, export in quite many different formats. One of them is PDF. Uh, and there are a couple of presets here for print, press ready, digital small size, digital high quality. Let's see the PDF for print. So the raster DPI is uh, automatically 300. And then you can choose if you include the bleed area or not. And I suggest that you click here on the more also to check, for instance, how much your JPEG images will be compressed. If there are images with bigger DPI than your 300 or whatever you have set here, then it will downsample them to everything to 300. And again, I wouldn't use a different resampling as the bilinear, probably one of these three. But right now I know that no, none of my images goes over the 300, so it doesn't matter really. Okay, there are lots of things that are applicable to print documents where we are not going to go right now. What is, what might be important would be the inclusion of the printer's marks, especially if you are printing it on your own printer and you want to cut it, then that this might interest you also. Uh, usually if you're doing something with an actual print house, it's uh, good to first call them, ask them what, what kind of things they want, want to have in the documents. Uh, what kind of color profiles also check those things and get that that right together with the printers and yes right now there's I think uh, all the images are by the way in RGB so it's not in CMYK which 
should be in the print print documents. Anyway. Mm. Yeah, also the area is quite uh, important. Is it all the spreads or is it all the pages? I'll put all the pages. Or you can say directly which pages, which you get in any uh, program that uh, uh, exports into PDF or prints uh, things. Okay, I will not export this right now, but uh, so that you know where to find this. Right, let's go to There we have the Moodle. And I'll add the date task here as a forum. Yes, we have June now. Page layout for a fictional. Magazine called well, it's Science Now. I don't know if that uh, uh, exists or not, but now it does for for our purposes. Okay, and now there's a good time to ask questions. Stop sh sharing and I'll also stop the recording now. <laughs> 